Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to start a series of videos on the philosophy of Bronze Age Pervert. In this first of three lectures over his well-known book, Bronze Age Mindset, we will cover part one, The Flame of Life. The other parts will be available as soon as tomorrow itself. However, only the first lecture will be available for public viewing. The rest will be reserved for members of the School of Forbidden Texts. However, you can join us there as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. For as little as the price of one cup of coffee at Starbucks, you can get better quality education than you would borrowing $50,000 per year in student loans to actually not go to any college anymore. That's become something of an anachronism. Now you're just watching free YouTube videos from your parents' house across the country from the campus that you are no longer really attending, including free YouTube videos from the Chad Haig channel itself, for which I actually demand a cut of that student loan money from the professors who basically stole my work. So um, you could do that, or you could do the real thing, as we are here at the School of Forbidden Texts. And of course, what college campus would allow you to read Bronze Age Mindset? Another reason why you should hesitate no more and join the school right away. Guess what, though? This is not actually a philosophy book, as Bronze Age Pervert tells us at the very beginning. It is rather exhortation. He notes that he was motivated to write this book about really what motivates him as a response against the proliferation of so many perversions which had been disseminated by those who multiply lies like metaphorical bioterrorists poisoning the metaphorical water supply of the population to make us all sick and weak as they are. They are doubly delusional, however, for in addition to being lies themselves, these lies are reflected into so many other mirrors, as he tells us, which bear even less reality than the lies of which they were a copy in the first place. This is like second and third order lying about lying, which is, of course, made possible by the technological infrastructure of the internet itself. As a result, what people lose is precisely their minds. Any stance of passivity with regard to this onslaught of technological nihilism will inevitably end the very notion of being qua being itself. Bronze Age pervert warns us if you wait any longer, everything will be pounded to garbage and then there will be nothing left. Much like my own hermeneutical death, the paradoxical outcome of the excessively filled out simulation of these lies is just the destruction both of the subject's mind and of the very possibility of the disclosure of being itself. Yet in a properly Nietzschean sense, the nothingness of nihilism is not simply the negative absence of any form whatsoever, as we would naively think, so much as it is itself simply the pseudo-form of ugliness. Bronze Age Pervert tells us, I am here to save you precisely from such great ugliness. Somehow, therefore, being qua being can only be accessed through the hermeneutical disclosure of the aesthetic form of beauty, as Nietzsche tells us, while nothingness is simply the failure to achieve any such great form. This is why Julius Evola warned us that materialism really is not anything like a positive answer to the question of being, so much as it is the largely negative phenomenon of a failure to achieve any such great form, as was understood all too well in the world of tradition. Likewise, Bronze Age Pervert tells us that the problem is not a total lack of energy among the worst nihilists, such as Hillary Clinton, so much as a demented energy, amounting really to a pure anger or lust for power with nothing more to qualify it. The will which wills the negation of such political power without any aesthetic form to qualify it with being is paradoxically, therefore, a will which fails to will anything positive at all. Despite solving the technical challenge of condensing the will into the most purified bloodthirsty drive for personal political power really within world history. Ironically, the most self-interested of all political hacks are also the ones bearing an inhuman gaze, indicating that they are in fact vehicles of something else beyond themselves. The dead robot eyes, so common among the NPCs, simply channel the commands of the technological system itself. 
More ironic still is the way that in a modern materialistic world explicitly supposed to be devoid of any metaphysical dualisms whatsoever, you can only see where it is you really live if Bronze Age pervert himself pulls back the curtain to reveal a great power that acts like a ghost at work in the background of all of these events which will inevitably be misrepresented by the media as they leave out this one crucial component. This applies, however, even to you yourself. You also fail to see how you really are because you miss the monstrous powers that are screwing you over in the background. Bronze Age Pervert, however, will show you exactly how this works. Likewise, the standard of real positive being which the dead robot eyes paradoxically lack in their excessive materialism is precisely this striving of the will beyond itself. Bronze Age Pervert tells us that life has a thing inside it that reaches beyond itself. This is the inter galactic warm. I cannot say it here, you must wait till later to get the full explanation, but if you don't reach beyond yourself, you are in fact dead, and most of mankind is this zombie state. This kind of being, however, is not unique to man in any anthropological sense, but is rather present in nature as the kind of irrepressible force which embodies the kind of active nihilism praised by Nietzsche, one which dissolves the seemingly secure values of man's standards and holds the human population within the bounds of a certain type of ecological limitation which ironically embodies the aesthetic ideal of beauty beyond anything really limited to the kind of technological simulation called art today in the ever looser sense of that term. Bronze Age Pervert tells us it's destruction of the feeble designs of reason and the pointless words of man. This is, in fact, beautiful. Likewise, Hegel's claim that the beauty of art is categorically different from the beauty of nature in the sense that the beauty of art is much higher because, according to Hegel, it has to pass through human spirit in order to manifest itself, whereas that is not a requirement for the beauty of nature. This attitude misses the point that the beauty of the will, as Bronze Age perfect understands it, is actually mostly within nature now. While humans under modern conditions have basically devolved to robots completely lacking in both beauty and will. This this power of nemesis, though, continues to burn inside at least some of you, though this is not at all democratically accessible to all. He notes that few are chosen to wield it, fewer still realize that they are chosen, let alone know what to do with it. This is, however, one of the old spirits moving subtly in the background, uh, who we should, in fact, embrace in this possessive function to rid the world of the kind of refuse of ugliness, nihilistic lies, and weakness which are currently predominant. May they inhabit us again and give us strength to purify this world of refuse, says Bronze Age pervert himself. Likewise, as we move on to part one, the flame of life, he opens by noting that it's recursively ironic that the biggest thing you've been misled about in your life is precisely the nature of this life itself. Interestingly, though, the negation of life is not the complete absence of any form whatsoever, as I already noted, so much as it is the reduction of life to the simulation of, as he calls it, two marionettes whose staged fighting will indeed mesmerize the viewer, but without allowing any level of real hermeneutical interpretation or thinking. It'll instead stimulate the viewer to respond with pre-programmed reflexes equivalent to the clapping of a seal. This, ironically, it is precisely because the puppet's lines had already been written by the system for the purpose of providing a Pavlovian distraction equivalent to that of ringing a bell before a dog that either one of the puppets are really saying nothing, no matter what the nominal political persuasions of each might seem to be. Bronze Age Pervert explicitly claims that before the rise of Donald Trump, even reactionary right-wing energy was absorbed into the simulation of distractions, which only hid the real suffering being advanced in the background by something of a, a right-wing equivalent of the system's neatest trick. You might recall that, say, in 2014, Andrea Tanteros, Judge Janine Gaynalash, and other hot anchors on Fox News would suck up this energy by redirecting it into outlets which burn themselves out in the outrageous spectacle of harmless media entertainment 
while playing itself out over the television set and over social media without actually affecting the internals of the system in the least, and in fact basically offering the same thing, but framed in a less obviously stupid manner than, say, Democrat Party talking heads on CNN. This is something which, however, you will indeed accept just because it's the lesser of two evils, even though it really does not change anything. This negation of real life in favor of a simulation proves that you you must understand, as he says, both left and right have been fooled about what is life. Good news, however, can be found in the reminder of a certain metaphor by Nietzsche of a herd of lesser animals transitively being empowered with a rush of freedom after the lead stallion among them had himself been captured by a wild spirit which basically infected the rest of them. This can only really be explained by the way that Nietzsche paradoxically acknowledged the difference between the great and the weak in terms of the power of the will without, however, falling into the traditional metaphysics of the ego. Greatness can indeed spill over, while at the same time not amounting to anything like the democratic lie of modernity that we're all basically the same. Yet on another level, the greatness of the will present within nature is fundamentally misunderstood if one subordinates in advance every single manifestation of it to the teleology of survival and reproduction. In truth, life as it is, when free, life in abundance, knows luxury, surfeit and waste. Survival and reproduction, however, are side effects of something else entirely, says Bronze Age pervert himself. This overemphasis on survival and reproduction as the real motive into which any action by a living thing whatsoever can ultimately be translated cannot explain, however, why the noblest animals actually refuse to procreate when they are trapped in captivity, and in the most extreme cases, they even refuse to keep living under such conditions. Freedom, Bronze Age pervert tells us, is not a Freudian distortion of the real unconscious drive to reproduce. It is instead a much more fundamental drive or rather will, which needs no presupposition of these other things in order to be what it really is. The professional methodology of uh, extrapolating from the motives of the lowest life forms like yeast to the motives of the highest in the sense of aesthetic form and greatness of the will such as man is actually therefore something of a pseudo-hermeneutics of showing you why the most complicated workings of the latter can still ultimately be reduced to the same essential skeleton embodied in the former. This actually gets the problem completely backwards. In fact, Jim Rickards noted in his 2021 book on the New Great Depression that we actually make a mistake by thinking of viruses as the result of evolution. They actually are thought to be the result of devolution, in which some higher form that was once alive somehow perfected the technology of infection and replicability through ceasing to be life at all. Even worse, therefore, than regressing to yeast, the lowest form of life, as Bronze Age pervert repeatedly warns us in this work, would be a regression to viruses, the negation of any life whatsoever. Ironically, the end result of technological meddling would be a pseudo-race of pseudo-humans reduced to pure viral bodies, which executes some hardwired function perfectly, precisely because they lack any life world kind context whatsoever. Likewise, Bronze Age Pervert has the guts to challenge the de facto pseudo-religion of our era by challenging Darwinism itself. It's ironic, though, to treat Darwinistic evolutionism as the folk metaphysics of our era, the answer to the question of what is being qua being, when even among the sciences themselves, biology is among the least capable of penetrating the deepest mysteries of existence and the universe, and was dismissed by Schopenhauer himself with the metaphor of people who collect big catalogs of monkeys and think that they have understood the deepest philosophical questions as a result. Ironically, despite the fact that biology is quite literally the study of life, if you look at the etymology in Greek, biologists make some of the stupidest assertions about life in this deeper Nietzschean sense of the will. 
It's also silly and just plain historically false to claim that Darwin invented the concept of the hereditary evolution in the sense of uh, traits being passed down from ancestors to descendants when any sheep farmer knows basically the same thing just from the practical experience of selectively breeding for some specific traits over others. Interestingly, though, Bronze Age pervert claims that the human robots of leftism have gone so far into their own ideology that they actually hate and fear the de facto pseudo-religion of Darwinism because it is ultimately incompatible with their own deeper philosophical need to posit all humans whatsoever as carbon copies of the same generic, anonymous, and contentless cog of the technological system. As you say, they need a non-subject who is fully determined by material and economic conditions, and in fact, they actively celebrate this materialistic determination as an excuse to not have to accomplish anything at all. That's why Bernie Sanders and his youth refused to hold down a job, on grounds that he was too busy with leftist political activism to bother with a relevant bullshit like actually working. His rise to stardom within the Democratic Party largely consisted of promising the voters that they too would no longer have to work if we just tax billionaires a little more and start dysfunctional government programs. However, espousing Darwin just because it's the alternative to something even stupider is to fall once again for the puppet show, or the right-wing version of the system's neatest trick as discussed a few slides ago. More specifically, though, what leftists fear is not really Darwin so much as just nature itself. There is, however, an inherent contradiction in the ideology of Darwinism itself, because on the one hand, it posits in advance that all events in the organism's life whatsoever are really just secondary distortions of the true meaning of attempts to survive and reproduce. But on the other hand, one actively denies the existence of teleology as an outdated metaphysical construct from the Aristotelian philosophy, which is so obviously incompatible with the need to reduce natural selection to an impersonal, materialistic, fully automatic mechanism, the functions of which cannot be contaminated by any humanistic prejudices, especially those from the ancient Greek world. Bronze Age pervert, however, claims that in practice, many biologists are so sloppy in their thinking that they actively shift from one stance to the other and then back again in a blatant case of the right hand not knowing what the left is doing. He says himself, actually, this is just a tautology. Yes, only those animals who have managed to reproduce actually pass on their traits, something every sheep breeder in history has also known. But the idea that this alone can explain animal adaptation or behavior is nonsense. Interestingly, Bronze Age pervert goes as far as to compare Darwinism to pre-Copernican astronomy. As time went on, you might recall, the models to correctly predict eclipses within that system had to become unnecessarily complicated because they were just adjusting to a fundamental presupposition established at the very beginning, which just happened to be dead wrong. That was, of course, the idea that the Earth is the center of the entire universe, an idea posited for religious and metaphysical reasons rather than scientific ones. Similarly, though, explaining the mystery of so many highly sophisticated innate types of knowledge and skill, which can be observed even in seemingly low animals through this pseudo-hermeneutics of survival and reproduction, has to also become absurdly complicated in order to adjust to a basic premise that is equally wrong. Above all, this fails to account for the way that there is an inherent intelligence inside things, uncanny, silent and demonic, of which our own intelligence is actually only an approximation and crude deviation. Likewise, the only way to really understand life is to study what it is driving at without falling for the temptation of reducing it to these two stereotypical teleological aims of survival and reproduction. In fact, Darwin really was not describing all life whatsoever, but only life under 19th century British conditions, in which industrialism had succeeded in solving the problem of infant mortality and therefore opening the path to colonize the rest of 
of the world for that one unspoken reason, yet ironically succeeded in creating conditions for life that were the most stressful thus far within history. Darwinism is therefore not a description of life without any further qualifications, but rather life under extreme stress. Yet this claim that life within an open-air prison is the definition of life itself misses the point that life reacts to the worst forms of being trapped by actively choosing its own death. In other words, in claiming to find the essence of life, one actually found its exact opposite. This is the equivalent of claiming that the Earth is in fact the center of the universe. Ironically, it is precisely those who really believe that survival is the only goal of life who will simply accept slavery if it means they at least get to keep surviving, while the truly great will either be free or they will not exist at all. In describing going to a nightclub in a rundown part of a city which the media largely pretends doesn't exist anymore, Bronze Age Pervert noted that he tried to really imagine being other people he saw there, such as whoever happened to live in a nearby apartment complex in which there was only one light on in the entire building. The irony is that the kind of universal love of mankind which is actively promoted by the system doesn't require you to actually do anything like that, that is to say, to imagine living many other lives instead of only your own. The only really, really meaningful definition of love, however, is just that. And of course, the one thing we never really try to imagine is what life would be like outside the cage altogether. What you will notice, though, if you actually try to observe that, is that unless a young animal had been artificially induced to be concerned about something else, for example, there was an injury to one of its body parts that redirected its attention to that, or the um, behaviorist experiments in which they would intentionally starve animals in order to prove that an animal that has not eaten in a very long time will be very interested in food, Unless you have that sort of meddling, you will notice that the first thing the um, animal will seek out will be space to explore its own abilities. Yet even beyond this, they will have a certain will to master their surroundings, especially in the evolving sense of submitting this lower unformed matter to some sort of higher form, which of course for Nietzsche is the achievement of aesthetic beauty. The will, therefore, is far more than any reductivist cliches of survival and reproduction, for this mastery of space applies even within the social realm to that of social space. Ironically, this sort of will to mastery of lower matter can only really happen if one is freed up from having to be concerned about things like having to survive as such, or even with reproduction, which an animal in this state won't even really think about. It is not a coincidence, then, that the drive to reproduce as such only becomes apparent to it after it had first succeeded in the more fundamental concerns of attaining power and freedom as such. Life is at its most basic, says Franz H. Pervert, just this struggle for the ownership of space. Don't believe him? Well, just think how angry you get when you're in a totally empty restaurant and then some assholes sit right next to you and then start chewing with their mouths wide open. This is the drive for space if there ever was one. Ironically, even though I've noted the irony in his work uh, several times thus far in this video, he forcefully asserts in the 15th section that I don't do irony. One thing about language, though, that does interest him here is with that the oldest languages are not so much built on the distinctions of grammatical gender as you would with, like, modern German um, between masculine and feminine, and, of course, neuter also, uh, so much as the grammatical categories of animate and inanimate. As an aside, some hunter-gatherer languages also distinguish distinguish edible and inedible as fundamental grammatical categories as such, which, if you think about it, is actually fairly important in such a context. Um, Bruns H. Pervert notes, however, that the animate-inanimate uh, distinction is not really satisfactory, for yeast really does not fit cleanly into either, for although it is alive in some base sense of the term, it is a far cry from the higher life 
uh, visible within those actually capable of achieving the great aesthetic form and only leads us to misinterpret the latter if we are misled into extrapolating from these simpler cases of life the laws of all life forms whatsoever. In a properly Nietzschean sense, the difference really is structural. Yeast can indeed expand, but is otherwise just the negative failure to achieve any form, while the higher life is all about the more morphological development, not just of, say, art, but even of its own form, which is capable of incredible functions for just that reason. We fail to understand what this intelligence in life really is because we make the error of treating energy and structure as two different things. In reality, though, the two are always one, for the almighty will is precisely the one whose own forms and abilities for self-differentiation is relatively endless, of which Heraclitus's fire is indeed an early but quite correct metaphorical description. In a properly Nietzschean sense, such greatness is indeed inherently aesthetic, which is why the ancient Greeks claimed that the kind of gods which were seen only within the realm of dreams had the most perfect bodily forms, a far cry, of course, from the physical decline to which Americans especially have been driven by modern conditions, such as driving all the time and eating processed food, in which the ugliness of the political scene is indeed accepted as a natural extension of the the ugliness which people quite literally are, even on a physical level alone. This is not actually anything new, however, as the domestic life of the village was also totally ugly with, as we forget, sewers, piling garbage, different forms of slavery, etc. Ironically, the technological advances are therefore something of a regression back to the lower category of yeast on aesthetic intellectual, and even on physical grounds. Speaking of beauty and the lack thereof, did you know that chimpanzees don't actually ever artificially pleasure themselves unless they are trapped in captivity? If you really think about the reason why, you'll notice that they're just too damn busy in the wild to need such distractions from their own boredom and purposelessness. What does this say, then, about the modern myth that being totally addicted to the technological simulation of adult entertainment is the very measure to determine how normal, politically correct, ethical, progressive, and mentally healthy somebody is? Why, it's almost as though these same corporations had some sort of financial interest in seeing to it that this sort of historically anomalous and largely negative habit was normalized so that they could maximize their own profits as a result of the universalization of the sex-positive ideology. How much more so, though, is this the case with the rise of robot marriages, the logical conclusion, really, of this same trend? The irony, though, according to Bronze age pervert himself, is that the hypersexualization of modernity only masks a weak and sick sexuality which ironically became so pathetic only after the system had itself mandated the sex-positive ideology to be universally accepted as a cultural staple, especially on all college campuses, but for technical reasons alone. Isn't the no-F cult just an attempt to try to reverse this trend towards the nihilism of being trapped in such pre-owned space in order to bring life back to its natural ascending state precisely through resisting the temptation that this offers up the ultimate form of consumerist freedom. Of course, before any SJWs butt in and angrily and self-righteously demand that such outdated religious moralism be confined to the pre-modern past, which it had been rightfully banished by the rise of the scientific revolution, they should keep in mind that it's actually inherently intellectually dishonest for such SJWs to claim to be committed to the total relativism of a secular materialist universe without any gods whatsoever, when their own fanatical commitment to moralistic absolutes as embodied in the linguistifications of political correctness would make no sense whatsoever if they actually inhabited such a world as that. If they had taken just two minutes to actually think through what their own supposed theories really mean, they might realize that. 
For example, Grounds Age pervert notes that under the conditions of materialistic determination of ideology, which such SJWs claim to espouse, even one's own hormones become something like an internalization of the material conditions, now transferred from the economic base of Marxism to an internal catalyst which made me do it so that I have no responsibility for my own actions. Yet how can one still maintain such a clear separation from me and the material conditions which affect it, even while shouting as loud as possible that one had reduced the former to an epiphenomenal effect of the latter. SJWs are the true religious believers of our era, because they're the ones who really believe that the me is such a soul which is separated from its own body, qua a complex of material conditions which oppress me even from without. Much like Zerzan, therefore, Bronze Age pervert does not fall for the BS of just blaming global capitalism, for he notes that it's actually the agricultural revolution itself which originally began the process of deforming man into a much more frail, much weaker, and much more insane version of himself, for which the supposed benefits of being able to rely on grain surpluses rather than be stuck in the insecurity of having to constantly hunt and gather um, did not at all justify the social perversion of a parasitic elite which those same grain surpluses made possible for the first time ever. How much worse, though, is the current technological order in all of these areas I just mentioned? The materialistic reduction of the universe itself to a totally disenchanted prison of unnatural perversions, for which there really is no more possibility of the mystery of nature, as uh, Penty Linkle also mentioned. That is the true virtual reality, while the original state of natural religious enchantment of the universe is not only unique to hunter-gatherers, but is present in animals too. Yet what is this enchantment except the power of life itself, which is strangely absent in the materialistic simulation? Proof that life is what's really missing from this can be found in the way that one almost has to break the rules just to feel anything whatsoever. For example, he talks about walking through the streets secretly drunk on hard liquor as the only way to escape the sort of emotionless numbness which is otherwise mandated by the system. In fact, even feeling the negative emotion of panic quite intensely would still be better than that. One of the great myths of our era is, of course, the fallacy that scientific disenchantment is something of a prerequisite attitude which then causes one to make great discoveries. This is actually wrong, for reason only ever helps to clarify some idea to make it more communicable to some other mind through language, etc. But the inspiration and insight needed to actually make the great discoveries in the first place requires exactly the opposite attitude, that of an immediate intuition of a great idea rather than the laborious reconstruction of it within syllogistic terms that make it uh, more understandable even by the lowliest minds in the herd. Isn't the tendency for such democratic mass to parrot scientific truths without any hermeneutical interpretation beyond the thought stopper that scientists said so, isn't that structurally identical to any religious dogmatism of pre-modern times, such as the idea that whatever the Pope said is true because the Pope said whatever the Pope said is true is true when he made himself infallible? Science is paradoxically the dominant superstition of our era, since it has become a largely negative inhibition of the hermeneutical procedure of active interpretation rather than the sort of liberating faculty to allow us all to grasp the truth. It is not the substance of science, once again, that is problematic, but rather the anti-hermeneutical function which it has unfortunately come to hold for the masses. Ironically, the problem with the evolutionist myth that natural history only ever flows in the direction of more progress is that it is actually far more likely for it to move from higher to lower life forms, even in naturalistic terms alone. What if beings of incomparable beauty and greatness had indeed existed in the vastly distant past, but disappeared precisely because the conditions for their preservation would have been so much more complex and demanding? 
than the conditions to preserve the basest of life forms. Similarly, within the human population itself, the outcome of the experiment of universal college education was only a mass of functionally illiterate, lazy humanoids for whom the professors and administrators eventually gave up trying to teach at all, with the realization that it would be a waste of time to try to force the lowest of minds to do the kind of real thinking which is actually worthy of the name. In all the terms that really matter, the greatest civilizations had already come, come and gone in the past and did not survive to the present day, but instead fell into extinction. Well, the scandal of global overpopulation today has indeed given us the basest pseudo-culture of all time, precisely because it was the most successful in the raw quantitative yeast Darwinist sense. Bronze Age Pervert notes, though, that it is quite strange to call the belief in reincarnation far-fetched when it was actually the norm of all the earliest peoples, especially the hunter-gatherers of the prehistoric Golden Age. We only dismiss this idea as nonsense, which is not even worthy to be mentioned by name, because we mistake the me that is reborn with the intellect and especially the physical mind. But this actually makes far more sense if you consider the reborn to be the will, which is eerily the same from one queen bee within a, a bee colony to the next. In fact, all the lower forms of life are nearly identical in the will, even if they are obviously different bits of matter. This is something which Aristotle also noted was the reason why he had to strictly distinguish material and formal cause, and it's something which was plagiarized by Ray Kurzweil in his assurance to you that, well, even if your physical body can't be preserved, we can preserve the real you qua a formal pattern which can be uploaded into the machine. How much more so, though, are natural forces like gravity uniform across all instances? And what problem does this pose for the stereotypical dismissals of the very concept of reincarnation? Likewise, the myth of artificial intelligence is actually something of a misnomer. What they mean when they say that is really artificial life, and not just any life, but life in the profound and a fundamental sense we have been discussing thus far. This, of course, takes the most perverse form of assuming that the artificial life which can be supposedly engineered to live forever is something which you yourself will eventually upgrade to after you realize it as the technical improvement upon the life that you already have. The Kurzweil fantasy is, however, really just the delusion that the universe itself is, at its deepest metaphysical level, made up of the material cause of information, and more specifically, that it is made up of the kind of symbolic constructs which geeks stuck on the inside of their own minds more so than the real world are comfortable with manipulating. It is ironic, then, that the most extreme form of materialism is one which actively hates matter and sees it as a technical problem, in a way not unlike the ancient Gnostic origins to which it maintains an unspoken connection. Insofar as such a perverted will might gain knowledge of such a universe qua information, it will always be forced by subtle and unspoken needs for power, which distort rather than reveal the true nature of that which is under discussion. This belief in empty words, so extreme as to block out the thing it is supposed to represent or make accessible, is, of course, linguistification. Proof that being for Nietzsche is not just the triumph of any form over matter, but specifically the aesthetic form of beauty over, say, the pseudo-form of technology, can be found in the way that societies which function through repressing such hunter-gatherer nature, not coincidentally, are also defined by a certain nihilistic hatred of beauty and a promotion of ugliness which simply covers the asses of the decrepit old fucks who run these societies who are themselves literally ugly. Yet isn't this physical ugliness often the result of allowing financial interests alone to dominate in, say, arranged marriages? A true case of technological pseudo-form, overwhelming the aesthetic beauty of life if there ever was one. For just this reason, and beauty-hating cultures like the one we inhabit also tend not to value things like private property or free personal space, which are basically the same thing after all. Not coincidentally, the same people
people who promote the former are already telling you that you won't get to have the latter for much longer. The problem with the modern myth of democratic equality, therefore, is that the ancient Greek term anthropos is actually something of a negative reference to shadow being indistinct, or some kind of humanoid shape, says Bronze Age pervert himself, while the man of power, that is, the rare true man, was a different word and was distinguished from the democratic mass largely through the latter's failure to achieve such great form. Above all, the great man's strength and courage signaled a certain excess in being, in line with the author's earlier claim, that being, paradoxically, is only really there if it is also there beyond itself. Bronze Age pervert, therefore, openly expresses agreement with Heraclitus' decision to use the metaphor of fire as the essence of all things and all action, rather than, say, the traditional Aristotelian notion of a static substance. The very notion of passivity in the face of its power is therefore absurd. It calls on us to allow ourselves to be possessed by it and to wage war on its behalf against its enemies. This will be the end of part one. The uh, second and third lectures will be available as early as tomorrow, but will be available for patrons only. Remember, join us at the School of Bin Texts, just $2 per month.